his company. Yeah. Bill and his company has been the spoil of me. Sir John, you are so fretful. <laughs> you cannot live long. Aye, there it is. Come, sing me a party. No, no, no. I, I was as virtuously given as a uh, gentleman need be. Virtuous enough. Oh. I, I swore a little mm. and uh, diced not. Oh. Above seven times a week. <laughs> <laughs> Went to a body house once. Once? Oh. In a quarter. A quarter? Of an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Paid money that I borrowed three out of four times. Lived cleanly and in good order. And now I live out of all order, out of all compass. Oh, yeah. You are so fat, Sir yeah. John. You, you must needs be living out of all compass, and out of all reasonable compass. Yeah. Do thou amend thy face, and I'll amend my oh. life. <laughs> oh, Dame Partlet the Hen, have you inquired yet who picked my pocket? For Sir John, what do you think, Sir John? Do you think I keep thieves in my house? Yeah, well. I have searched. I have even so is my husband, man by man, boy by boy, servant by servant. The tithe of a hair was never lost in my house before. You lie, hostess. Bought off was shaved and lost many a hair. <laughs> and I'll be sworn my pocket was picked. Go to, you are a woman, go. Oh, I, no, I defy thee. Oh, God's light, I was never called so in my own house before. <laughs> go to, I think I know me well enough. No, Sir John, you do not know me, Sir oh. John. I know you, Sir John. You owe me the money, Sir John, and now you in a quarrel to beguile me of it. I bought you a dozen of shirts to your back. Old linen, the most paltry rag scrabble linen. You owe me money here besides, Sir John, for your diet and drinkings, and money lent you. Four and twenty pounds. Oh, well, he had his part, let him pay. Oh, he is poor, he hath nothing. <laughs> Cannot I take mine ease in mine inn, but I shall have my pocket picked? I lost a seal ring of my grandfather worth forty marks. Oh, Jesu, I have heard the prince tell him I know not how. That ring was copper. Oh, the <laughs> prince is a sneak copper, Jack. And he were here, I would cudgel them like a dog, and he would say so. <laughs> and had my pocket picked. This house has become body house. They pick pockets. Well, what didst thou lose, Jack? Wouldst thou believe me? A three or four bonds of 40 pound apiece and a seal ring of my grandfather. A trifle, some eight penny matter. So oh. I told him, my lord, and I said I heard your grace say so, and my lord, he speaks most vilely of you like a foul-mouthed man as he is, and said he would cudgel you. What? He did not. <laughs> no, there's neither faith, truth, nor womanhood in me, else. There's no more faith in thee than in a stewed prune. Oh. Go, you thing, go. Say what? Thing? Oh. What? Oh. Thing? Oh. Oh, why, a thing to thank God on? <laughs> I have no thing to thank God on, I would thou shouldst know it. Well, I am an honest man's wife, and setting thy knighthood aside, thou art a knight to call me so. Setting thy womanhood aside, thou art a beast to say otherwise. So what beast? Oh, no, no, no. What beast? Why, an otter. An otter, <laughs> Sir John, why an otter? Oh, why, she's neither fish nor flesh. A man knows not where to have her. <laughs> thou art an unjust man in saying so. Thou or any man knows where to have me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thou say 
his true hostess, and he slanders thee most grossly. So he doth you, my lord, and said this other day, you owed him a thousand pounds. Oh, Sirrah, do I owe you a thousand pounds? A thousand pounds? A million! Thy love is worth a million dollars. Me, thy love. Nay, 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 my lord. He called you Jack and said he would cudgel you. Oh, did I, Bardolph? Indeed, Sir John, you said so. <laughs> yeah, if he said my ring was copper. I say tis copper. Oh, 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 oh. there shall be as good as thy word now. Oh, well, thou knowest, as thou art man, I dare. But as thou art prince, I fear thee as I fear the roaring of a lion's whelp. Meow. <laughs> and why not as the lion? Oh, the king is the lion. Dost thou think I'll fear thee as I fear thy mother? Nay, and I do so. I uh, pray my girdle break. Oh, and if it should, how thy guts would fall about thy knees. <laughs> but there's no room for faith, truth, nor honesty in this bosom of thine. But tis all filled up with guts and midriff. <laughs> Charge an honest woman with picking thy pockets. Why, thou whoreson, impudent, embossed rascal. Mm. If there were anything in thy pockets but tavern reckonings, memorandums of bawdy houses, and one poor pennyworth of sugar candy to make thee long-winded, if thy pockets were enriched with any other injuries but these, I am a villain. And yet you will stand to it, you will not Pocket up wrong. Why? Art thou not ashamed? Why, Hal? Thou knowest in the state of innocency Adam fell. <laughs> what should poor Jack Falsap do in these days of villainy? Thou seest I have more flesh than another man, and therefore more frailty. But you confess, you picked my pocket. It appears so <laughs> by the story. Hostess, I forgive thee. Uh, uh, go, make ready breakfast. Thou seest I'm tractable to any honest reason. Uh, uh, nay, uh, thou seest I'm pacified still. Uh, I say, uh, uh, be gone. <laughs> But how? The news at court. For the robbery, how is that answered? Oh, my sweet beef. I must still be good angel to thee. The money is paid back again. Oh, I like not that paying back his double labor. I am good friends with my mother and may do anything. <laughs> Rob me, the queen's exchequer, the next thing thou dost, and do it with unwashed hands. <laughs> do, my lord. <laughs> I have procured thee, Jack, a charge of foot. Oh, I would it were of horse. Lord right. My lord, go bear this letter to Lord John of Lancaster, to my brother John, this to my lord of Westmoreland. <laughs> go, point, to horse, to horse, for thou and I have thirty miles to ride, yet to air dinner time. <laughs> Jack, meet me tomorrow in the Temple Hall at two o'clock in the afternoon. There shalt thou know thy charge, and there receive money and order for their furniture. The land is burning. Percy stands on high. And either we or they must lower lie. Rare words. Mm. Brave world. Hostess, my breakfast come. Oh, I could wish this tavern were my drum. My noble Scot, I cannot flatter. I do defy the tongues of soothers, but a braver place in my heart's love has no man than yourself. Thou art the king of honor. No man so potent <laughs> breathes upon the ground, but I will beard him to Do so it is well. What letters hast thou there? I can but thank you. These letters come from your mother. Letters from her? Why comes she not herself? She cannot come, my lord. She is grievous sick. Zones! How had she the leisure to be sick in such a rustling time? <laughs> <laughs> who, who leads her power? Under whose government come they alone? Her letters bear her mind. Not I, my lord. 
I prithee tell me, doth she keep her bed? She does, my lord. Four days ere I set forth, and at the time of my departure thence, she was much feared by her physician. Sick now? Droop now? This sickness doth infect the very lifeblood of her enterprise. Tis, tis catching hither, even to our camp. She writes me here that her friends by deputation could not so soon be drawn, nor did she think it meet to lay so dangerous and dear a trust on any soul removed on her own. Yet doth she give us bold advertisement that with our small conjunction we should on to see how fortune is disposed to us. For, as she writes, there is no quailing now because the king is certainly possessed of all our purposes. What say you to it? Your mother's sickness is a maim to us. Perilous catch, a very limb lopped off. The quality and air of our attempt brooks no division. It will be thought by some who know not why she is away that wisdom, loyalty, and mere dislike of our proceedings kept the Earl from hence. And think how such an apprehension may turn the tide of fearful faction and breed a kind of question in our cause. You stray too far. I'd rather of her absence make this use. It lends a luster and more great opinion, a larger dare to our great enterprise than if the Earl were here. For men must think, if we without her help can make a head to push against a kingdom, with her help we shall overturn it topsy-turvy down. Yet all goes well, yet all our joints are whole. As hard can think, there is not such a word spoke of in Scotland as this term of fear. <laughs> ah, my cousin Vernon. Welcome by myself. Pray God my news be worth a welcome, Lord. The Earl of Westmoreland, 7,000 strong, is marching hitherwards. With him, Prince John. No harm. What more? And further, I have learned the king herself in person is set forth with strong and mighty preparation. She shall be welcome too. Where is her son, the, the nimble-footed madcap Prince of Wales, and his comrades that doubt the world aside and bid it pass? All furnished, all in arms, all plumed like eagles having lately bathed, glittering in golden coats like images, as full of spirit as the month of May, and gorgeous as the sun at midsummer, wanton as youthful goats, wild as young bulls. I saw young Harry, gallantly armed, rise from the ground like feathered mercury, and vaulted with such ease unto his seat as if an angel jump down from the clouds to turn and wind a fiery pegasus and wait the wall with noble horsemanship. No more! No more. <laughs> Worse than the sun in March, this praise doth nourish acues. Let them come. They come like sacrifices in their trim, and to the fire-eyed maid of smoky war, all hot and bleeding will be offered them. Come, let me taste my horse who is to bear me like a thunderbolt against the bosom of the Prince of Wales. Harry to Harry shall hot horse to horse meet and ne'er part till one drop down a corpse. Oh, oh. That Glendower was oh. There is more news. I learned he cannot draw his power this 14 days. Oh, that's the worst tidings I hear of yet. Aye, by my faith, that bears a frosty sound. What may the king's whole battle reach unto? Uh, uh, to 30,000. Forty, let it be. My mother and, and Glendower being both away, the powers of us may serve so great a day. Come, let us take a muster speedily. Doomsday is near. Die all, die merrily. Talk not of dying. I am out of fear of death or death's hand for this one half year. Get thee before me to Coventry and fill me a bottle of sack. Our soldiers shall march through Will to Sutton Coalfield tonight. Will you give me money, Captain? Lay out, lay out. Have my Lieutenant Peto meet me at Townsend. Right here, he will, Captain. Farewell. 
I have misused the king's press damnably. I have got, in exchange of 150 soldiers, 300 and odd pounds. <laughs> I, I press me none but good householders, yeoman sons, uh, inquired about contracted bachelors, such as been asked twice on the bands. And they all complained of bone spurs or the like. <laughs> oh, bought out their services. <laughs> and now my entire company consists of slaves as ragged as Lazarus in the painted cloth where the Gutton's dogs licked his sores. And such as were never soldiers, but rejected unjust serving men revolted tapsters and ostlers. One hundred and fifty tattered prodigals lately come from swine keeping and eating draft and husks. A mad fellow met me on the way and told me I had emptied all the gibbets and pressed the dead bodies. No, I had seen such scarecrows. <laughs> Indeed, my entire company is just but a shirt and a hat and that half shirt is two napkins tucked together and tossed over the shoulders like an herald's coat without sleeves. <laughs> well, that's all one. They'll find linen enough on every hedge. <laughs> well, what noise is this? How oh, now, blown jack? How oh, now, quill town? Mad wag, what makes thou in Warwickshire? Point, I cry thee mercy, I thought thou hast already been in Shrewsbury. Faith, Sir John, tis more than time that you were there too. Mm -hmm. I can tell you the king waits for us all. We must away all night. Tut, never fear. I am as vigilant as a cat to steal cream. I think to steal cream indeed, for thy offense hath already made thee butter. <laughs> but tell me, Jack, whose fellows are these that come after? Mine, pal, mine. I did never see such pitiful rascals. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're good enough to toss. Food for powder. Food for powder. Now, they'll fill a pit as well as better. Mortal men. Mortal men. Aye, but Sir John, methinks they are exceeding poor and bare, too beggarly. Well, as for their poverty, I know not where they have that. As for their leanness, I'm sure they never learned that of me. No, <laughs> and I'll be sworn. But, Sarah, make haste. Percy is already in the field. What, is the king in camp? She is, Sir John. I fear we shall stay too long. Point! Yeah. To the latter end of a fray. And the beginning of a fest. Ah, fits a dull fighter. And a keen guess. We'll fight with her tonight. It may not be. Give her then the advantage. Why say you so? Look she not for supply. So do we. Hers is certain, ours is doubtful. Good cousin, be advised, stir not tonight. Do not, my lord. But you do not counsel well. <coughs> you speak it out of fear and cold heart. Do me no slander, Douglas. I hold as little counsel with weak fear as you, my lord, or any Scot that this day lives. Let it be seen tomorrow in the battle which of us fears. Yea, or tonight. Content! Tonight, say I. Come! Come, it may not be. I wonder much, being men of such great leading as you are, that you see not what impediments strike back our expedition. Certain horse of my cousins are not yet come up. Your uncle Worcester's horse came but today. Now their pride and metal is asleep. The courage with hard labor, tame and dull, that not a horse is half the half of himself. So are the horses of the enemy, in general, journey beaten and, and brought low. The better part of ours are full of rest. The and number of the king exceedeth ours. For God's sake, cousin, stay till all come in. <laughs> Gracious offers from the king, if you vouchsafe me hearing and respect. Welcome, Sir Walter Blunt. <laughs> <laughs> 
Would to God you were of our determination. Some of us love you well, but you stand against us like an enemy. And God defend, but still I should stand so, so long as you stand against anointed majesty. But to my charge, the king hath sent to know the nature of your griefs, and whereupon you conjure from the breast of civil peace such bold hostility, teaching her duteous lands audacious cruelty. If that the king have any way your good deserts forgot, which she confesseth to be manifold, she bid you name your griefs, and with all speed you shall have your desire, with interest, and absolute pardon for yourself and these herein misled by your suggestion. <laughs> The king is kind, and, and well we know the king knows at what time to promise when to pay. <laughs> my mother and my uncle and myself did give her that same royalty she wears. And when she was not six and twenty strong, sick in the world's regard, wretched and, and low, a, a poor, unminded outlaw, sneaking home, my mother gave her welcome to the shore. And when she heard her swear and vow to God, she came but to be Duke of Lancaster, to sue her livery and beg her peace with, with tears of innocency and terms of zeal. My mother, in kind heart and pity moved, swore her assistance and performed it too. Now, when the lords and barons of the realm perceived Northumberland did lean to her, the more and less came in with cap and knee met her in boroughs, cities, villages, attended her on bridges, stood in lanes, la laid gifts before her, proffered her their oaths, gave her their heirs as pages, followed her even at the heels in golden multitudes. I came not to hear this. <laughs> then to the point. <laughs> in short time after, she deposed the king. <laughs> Soon after that, deprived him of his life, and in the neck of that took the whole state. To make that worse, she suffered her kinsman Mortimer, who is in every owner of well placed, indeed her king, to be engaged in Wales, there without ransom to lie forfeited, disgraced me in my happy victories, sought to entrap me by intelligence, rated mine uncle from the council board, in rage dismissed my mother from the court, broke oath on oath, committed wrong on wrong, and, and in conclusion, drove us to seek out this head of safety, and withal, to pry into her title, the which we find too indirect for long continuance. Shall I return this answer to the king? <laughs> Not so, Sir Walter. <laughs> We'll withdraw a while. Go to the king. Let there be upon some surety for a safe return again, and in the morning early shall my uncle bring her our purposes, and so farewell. I would. Would you accept of grace and love? Maybe so we shall. Pray God you do. the sun begins to peer above yon bosky hill. The day looks pale in his discomfiture. The southern wind doth play the trumpet to his purpose, and by his hollow whistling in the leaves foretells a tempest and a blustering day. Well, then with the losers let it sympathize, for nothing can seem foul to those who win. How now, my lord of Worcester? It is not well that you and I should meet upon such terms as now we meet. You have abused our trust and made us doff our easy robes of peace to crush our old limbs in ungentle steel. This is not well, my lord. This is not well. What say you to it? Will you again unknit the churlish knot of all abhorred war? and move in that obedient orb again, where you did give a fair and natural life, and be no more an exhaled meteor, a prodigy of fear and portent of broached mischief to the unborn hours. Hear me, my liege. For mine own part, I could be well content to entertain the lag end of my life in quiet hours. 
for I do protest I have not sought the day of this dislike. You have not sought it. How comes it then? <laughs> Rebellion lay in his way, and he fell upon it. <laughs> Peace, shew it. Peace. It pleased your majesty to turn your looks of favor from myself and all our house. And yet, I must remember you, my lord. We were the first and dearest of your friends. For you, my staff of office, did I break in Richard's time and posted day and night to meet you on the way and kiss your hand. <coughs> when yet you were in place and in account nothing so strong and fortunate as I, it was myself, my sister, and her son that brought you home and boldly did outdare the dangers of the time you swore to us. And you did swear that, oh, that Doncaster, that you did nothing purpose against the state, nor claim no further than your new fallen right, the seat of Gaunt, dukedom of Lancaster. To this we swore our aid. But in short space, it rained down fortune, showering on your head. And such a flood of greatness fell on you, what with our help, what with the contrarious winds that held the king so long in his unlucky Irish wars that all in England did repute him dead? And from this swarm of fair advantages, you took the occasion to be quickly wooed to grip the general sway into your hand. Forget your oath to us at Duncaster, and being fed by us, you used us. So as that ungentle hull, the cuckoo's bird, used at the sparrow, did oppress our nest, grew by our feeding to so great a bulk that even our love durst not come near thy sight for fear of swallowing. But with nimble wing we were enforced for safety's sake to fly out of sight and raise this present head by which we stand opposed by such means as you yourself have forged. Oh, indeed, all this you have articulated, proclaimed at market crosses, read in churches, to face the garment of rebellion with some fine watercolors that would please the eye of fickle changelings, and poor discontents that gape and rub the elbow <laughs> in the news of early, early innovation, and never yet did watercolors so imprint someone like yourself. Both your armies. There is many a soul shall pay full dearly for this encounter if once they meet in triumph. Tell your nephew, the Prince of Wales doth join with all the world in praise of Henry Percy. I do not think a braver gentleman, more daring or more bold, is now alive to grace this latter age with noble deeds. For my part, I may speak it to my shame. I have a truant been to chivalry, and so I hear he doth account me too. Yet this be for my mother's majesty. I am content that he shall take the odds of his great name and estimation and will to save the blood on either side. Try fortune with him in a single fight. And Prince of Wales, so dare we venture thee, although considerations infinite do weigh against it. No, good Worcester, no. We love our people well, even those we love who are misled upon your cousin's part. <coughs> And if he will accept the offer of our grace, both he and they and you, every man, shall be my friend again, and I'll be his. Go and tell your cousin what he will do. But if he will not yield, rebuke and dread correction wait on us, and they will do our bidding. Go now. We will not now be troubled with reply. We offer fair. Take it advisedly. It will not be accepted on my life. The Douglas and the Hotspur, both together, are confident against the world in arms. Hence every leader then to his charge, for on their answer we will set on them, and God befriend us, for our cause is just. How, if thou dost see me down in battle, stride me thus, it is a point of friendship. Nothing but a colossus can do thee that friendship. Say thy prayers and farewell. Ah, I would it were. 
Toward bedtime and all well. Why? Thou owest God a death. <coughs> Tis not due yet. <laughs> <laughs> I would be loath to pay him before his day. Why need I be so forward with him that calls not on me? Ah, eh, never mind. Honor pricks me on. <laughs> How if honor prick me off when I come on? Can honor set to a leg? No. Or an arm? No. Ah, or take away the grief of a wound? No. Honor hath no skill in surgery then? No. What is honor? A word. What is that word? Honor. What is that honor? <laughs> Air, a trim reckoning. Who hath it? He that died a Wednesday, doth he feel it? No. Doth he hear it? No. Tis insensible then, yea, to the dead. <sighs> Will it not live with the living? No. <laughs> Why? Detraction will not suffer it. Therefore, I'll none of it. Honor is a mere scutcheon. Yeah. Thus ends my catechism. <laughs> <laughs> No, Sir Richard, the liberal and kind offer of the king. Twere best he did. Then we are all undone. It is not possible. It cannot be the king should keep her word in loving us. She will suspect us still and find a time to punish this offense in other faults, for treason is but trusted like the fox. My nephew's trespass may be well forgot. It hath the excuse of youth and heat of blood and an adopted name of privilege, a harebrained hotspur governed by a spleen. All his offenses live upon my head and on his mother's. We did train him on, and his corruption being taken from us, we, as the spring of all, shall pay for all. Therefore, good cousin, let not Harry know in any case the offer of the king. Deliver what you will. I'll say it is so. Here comes your cousin. Uncle, what news? The king will bid you battle presently. Defy her, and by the lord of us morning. Lord Douglas, go you and tell him so. Marry, I shall, and very willingly. There is no seeming mercy in the king. Did you beg any, God forbid? I told her gently of our grievances, of her oath-breaking, which she mended thus by now forswearing that she is forsworn. She calls us rebels, traitors, and will scourge with haughty arms this hateful name in us. Arm, gentlemen, to arms, for I have thrown up brave defiance in the king's teeth, and Westmoreland that was engaged did bear it, which cannot choose but bring them quickly on. The Prince of Wales stepped forth before the king and nephew challenged you to single fight. <laughs> <laughs> Would the quarrel lay upon our heads, and that no man might draw short breath today but I and, and Harry Monmouth Tell me, tell me, how showed his tasking? Seemed it in, in contempt? No! By my soul, I never in my life did hear a challenge urged more modestly. He gave you all the duties of a man, trimmed up your praises with a princely tongue, spoke to your deservings like a chronicle, and which became him like a prince indeed. He made a blushing sidle of himself and chid his true youth with such a grace as if he mastered there a double spirit of teaching and of learning instantly. There did he pause. But let me tell the world, if he should outlive the envy of this day, England did never owe so sweet a hope, so much misconstrued in his wantonness. Cousin, I think thou art enamored on his follies. <laughs> never did I hear of any prince so wild a libertine, that be he as he will. Yet once ere night I shall embrace him with a soldier's arm, that he shall shrink under my courtesy. Arm! Arm with speed! And fellow soldiers, friends, better consider what you have to do than I, that, that, that have not well the, the gift of tongue, can lift your blood up with persuasion. My lord, here are letters for you. I cannot read them now. 
Gentlemen, the time of life is short. And if we live, we live to tread on kings. Aye. If die, brave death when princes die with us. For our consciences, the arms are fair when the intent of bearing them is just. My lord, prepare. The king comes apace. I thank her that she cuts me from my tail, for I profess not talking. Only this, let, let each man do his best. And here draw I a sword, whose temper I intend to stain with the best blood that I can meet with all in the adventure of this perilous day. Now, Esperance, Percy, and set on! Sound all the lofty instruments of war! And by that music, let us all embrace for heaven to earth. Some of us never shall a second time do such a courtesy. <laughs> upon my head. So then, my name is Douglas, and I do haunt thee in the battle thus, because some tell me that thou art a king. I tell thee true. The Lord of Stafford, dear today, hath bought thy likeness, but instead of thee, this sword hath ended him. So shall it be, unless thou yield thee as my prisoner. I was not born a yielder, thou proud Scot. And thou shalt find a king that will revenge Lord Stafford's death! <laughs> <laughs> where they are peppered. There's not but three of my hundred and fifty left alive, and they are for town's end to beg during life. Oh! Nothing but noise is this. What? Stand thou idle here, lend me thy sword. What? Many a nobleman lies stark and stiff under the hoofs of vaunting enemies whose deaths are yet unrevenged. I prithee, Lend me thy sword. And I, I prithee give me leave to breathe a while. Uh, the Sir Gregory have not done such deeds in arms as I have done today. Oh, uh, uh, I have paid Percy and made him sure. Uh, 
He is indeed, and living to kill thee, I prithee. Lend me thy sword. Nay, if Percy be alive, thou gets not my sword. Take my pistol, if thou wilt. Give it to me. What, is it in the case? Uh, oh, aye, aye. <laughs> there it is hot, tis hot. Is there that will sack a city? <laughs> what? Is it a time to jest and dally oh. now? On! Yeah. Yeah. Well, be alive. I'll pierce him if he come my way. If he come my wailing, will he become my way? If I, if, the, if, if I come his willingly, let him make a carbonado out of me. I want not such grinning honor that Sir Walter hath. Give me life, which if I can save, so. If not, honor unlooked for comes. And there's an end. Oh, I prithee, Harry, withdraw thyself, thou blades too much, Lord John of Lancaster, go you with him. Not I, my lord, unless I did bleed too. I beseech your majesty, stand up, lest your retirement to amaze your friends. I will do so, points, lead him to his tent. Come, my lord, I'll lead you to your tent. Oh, lead me. I do not need your help. And God forbid a shallow scratch should drive the Prince of Wales from such a field as this, where stained nobility lies trodden on and rebels' arms triumph in massacres. <laughs> we plead too long. Come, points are duty this way, life. For God's sake, man, come. <laughs> ah! My God, thou hast deceived me, Lancaster. I did not think thee lord of the spirit before. I loved thee as a brother, John. But now, I do respect thee as my soul. I saw him hold Lord Percy at the point with bolder maintenance than I did look for in such an ungrown warrior. Oh, this boy lends metal to us all. <laughs> Turn and face me. I and the Douglas, fatal to all that wear those colors on them. What art thou that counterfeitest the person of a king? The king herself, who, Douglas, grieves at heart so many of her shadows thou hast seen, and not the very king. I have two boys seek Percy and thyself about the field, but seeing thou fallst on me so luckily, I will assay thee, defend thyself. I fear thou art another counterfeit, and yet in faith, Thou bearest thee like a king, but where thou be, thus I end thee! Mistake not. Thou art Harry Monmouth, 
Thou speak'st as if I would deny my name. My name is Harry Percy. Why? Then I see a very valiant rebel of the name. I am the Prince of Wales, and think not, Percy, <laughs> to share with me in glory any more. Two stars keep not their motion in one sphere, nor can one England brook a double reign of Harry Percy and the Prince of Wales. Nor shall it, Harry, for the hour is come to end the one of us. And would to God thy name in arms were now as great as mine. I'll make it greater ere I part from thee, and all the budding honors on thy crest I'll corrupt to make a garland for my head. I can no longer brook thy vanity. Ah, ah, ah to it, Harold. Ah, you ah, find ah, boys ah, by ah, him. Ah, ah, oh, 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 oh. Harry, thou hast robbed me of my youth. I better brook the loss of greater life than those proud titles thou hast won of me. They wound my thoughts worse than thy sword, my flesh. But thoughts the slaves of life, and life, time's fool, and time that takes survey of all the world must have a stop. <laughs> I could prophesy, but that the earthy and cold hand of death lies on my tongue. No, Percy, thou art dust and food for... <laughs> for worms, great Percy. <laughs> Fare thee well, great heart. Ill-weaved ambition! How much art thou shrunk when that this body did contain a spirit, a kingdom for it, was too small a bound. But now, two paces of the vilest earth is room enough. This earth that bears thee dead bears not alive so stout a gentleman. If thou wert sensible of courtesy, I should not make so dear a show of zeal, but let my favors hide thy mangled face. And even in thy behalf, I will thank myself for doing these fair rites of tenderness. Adieu. Take thy praises with thee to heaven. Thy ignominy sleep with thee in the grave but not remembered in thy epitaph. What? Old acquaintance, could not all this flesh keep in it a little life? Poor Jack, farewell. I could have better spared a better man. <laughs> oh, I should have heavy miss of thee! If I were much in love with vanity, death hath not struck so fat a deer today, <laughs> though many deer are in this bloody fray. Embowled will I see thee by and by, till then in blood by noble person. Lie. <laughs> embowled? If thou embowel me today, I give thee leave to pout on thee and eat me too tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it was time to counterfeit all well, that hot Timagon Scott had paid me. Scott and lot to <laughs> counterfeit? Nay, I lie. I do not 
counterfeit, to die is to counterfeit, for he is the counterfeit of a man who hath not the life of a man. But to counterfeit dying when a man thereby liveth is to be no counterfeit but the true and perfect image of life itself. <laughs> Aye. The better part of valor is discretion, in the which better part I have saved my life. <laughs> Soon, this gunpowder Percy frights me, though he be dead. <laughs> what if he should counterfeit and rise? <laughs> ah, by my troth, he should prove the better counterfeit. I'll make him sure then, yea, and say, I killed him. <laughs> Why may not he rise as well as I? Yeah. Well, nothing confutes me but eyes. And no eye sees me. <laughs> Therefore, said I, with a fresh wound in your thigh, <clears throat> come you along with me. <laughs> <laughs> Come, brother John, full bravely hath thou flesh to thy maiden sword. <laughs> but, son, who have we here? Did you not tell me this fat man was dead? I did, I saw him dead, breathless and bleeding upon the ground. Art thou alive? Or is it fantasy that plays upon our eyesight? I prithee, speak. <coughs> We will not trust our eyes without our ears. Thou art not what thou seest. Uh, nay, it is true. Uh, uh, I am no double man. Uh, uh, but if I be not Jack Bolster, then am I no Jack. Then am I a Jack. Uh, uh, oh, here lies Percy. If your mother will do me any honor, so. If not, let her kill the next Percy herself. I look to be an earl or a duke, I can assure you. Why, <laughs> Percy, I killed myself and saw thee dead. Lord, Lord, how the world is given to lying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I grant you, I was down and out of breath, and so was he. But we rose both at an instant and fought together a long hour by Shrewsbury Club. <laughs> well, I swear on my life, I gave him this wound in the thigh. Why, if he were alive and would deny it, I'd make him eat a piece of my sword. <laughs> this is the strangest tale that ever I heard. This is the strangest fellow, Brother John. Come, bring your luggage nobly on your back. Uh, For my oh. part, if a lie may do thee grace, I'll gild it. With the happiest terms I have. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> the trumpet sounds retreat. The day is ours. Come, Brother John, look to the highs of the field. See what friends are living, who are dead. I will follow as they say for reward. <laughs> She that rewards me, may God reward her. <laughs> uh, 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 <ooh. laughs> if I do grow great, I will grow less. For I, I will purge and, and leave sack and sugar and live cleanly uh, as a nobleman should. <laughs> Did rebellion find rebuke? Ill-spirited Worcester, did we not send grace and pardon and terms of love to all of you? And wouldst thou turn our offers contrary, misuse the tenor of thy kinsman's trust? Three knights upon our party slain today, a noble earl and many a creature else had been alive this hour, if like a Christian thou hadst truly born betwixt our armies, true intelligence. What I have done, my safety urged me to. And I embrace this fortune patiently, since not to be avoided it falls on me. Fair Worcester to the death. 
and Vernon too. Other offenders we will pause upon. How goes the field? The noble Scots, Lord Douglas, when he saw the fortune of the day quite turned from him, the noble Percy slain and all his men upon the foot of fear, fled with the rest. And falling from a hill, he was so bruised that the pursuers took him. At my tent, Douglas is, and I beseech your grace, I may dispose of him. With all my heart. Then, Brother John of Lancaster, to you this honorable bounty shall belong. Go to the Douglas and deliver him up to his pleasure, ransomless and free. His valor, shown upon our crest today, hath taught us how to cherish such high deeds, even in the bosom of our adversaries. I thank your grace for this high courtesy, which I shall give away immediately. Then this remains, that we divide our powers. You, son John, and Poins, to York will bend you with the dearest speed to meet Northumberland and that prelate Scroop, who, as we hear, are busily in arms. <coughs> Myself and you, son Harry, will to Wales to fight Glendower and the Earl of March. Rebellion in this land shall lose its sway, meeting the check of such another day. And since this business so fair is done, let us not leave till all our own be one. So we depend on your donations for costumes, for sets, for props, and so on and so forth. So please, after I'm finished here, we'll see members of the cast with hats and with baskets. Please give whatever you can to us so we can continue to be here next year. On behalf of the Curtain Theatre, I bid you all adieu. Thank you much, Willie. Oh, many oh. talents.
Knights with you. Brother.